All right. Uh, so let's get started. So our first presentation is from Joshua of Map Kibera, and he'll be talking about the 15 years of Map Kibera and beyond, how they've used OSM, and how it has impacted them. So welcome, Joshua. Hello, everyone. Welcome once again to Nairobi. This is day two, and the weather is kind of friendly today, right? Compared to yesterday. Um, my name is Ogure Joshua. Um, I think and I hope you have started to get a feel of Nairobi since you arrived here. Um, and I think and also hope that you are getting to interact with Kenyans, the locals, get hold of them so that you can get a better feel of Nairobi, so that you can get the best experience you may need. Uh, this talk is about mapping Kenya, 15 years of Map Kibera and beyond. In 2009, Map Kibera was found. Almost 15 years here in Nairobi. Erika Hagen and Mikel Maroon came in here. Many of you know, must know, uh, must have met or must have known Mikel. I'm sorry that Erika is not here with us today. We miss her. As you may have heard, she could not be with us. They came here to Kenya without any prior experience of here or Africa. And they fell in love with this country. Sadly, all that time, they have never had a chance to take any proper safari. That's too bad. They started in Kibera, which I hope some of you will get a chance to visit and get to experience and know how the place looks like. It's pretty different from where we are, or just around Westlands here. On Monday morning, please let me know if some of you would be interested to come down to Kibera and, if it, and even visit our offices. We'll have a sign-up sheet out there on the board. So if you're interested, please sign up for that on Monday, 11 a.m. We'll be ready to host you. Uh, Open Street Map itself is 20 years old this year. Happy birthday to Open Street Map. This is Nairobi in the OSM today. Many of us have contributed to this map. I am very proud of this map and everything the mappers have built in it. I have to say this open street map community is very special and unique. Well, that's today. Let's examine where we have come from. OSM in Africa and around the world is built on centuries of map making. Some say there was no map making before in Africa was colonized. I say there is a little evidence, as you can see, of map making. But that only means little evidence survives. Note that maps did not exist, or that there was lack of navigation technologies. This map is an exception from the Tere region of Ethiopia illustrating names and directions of provinces relative to sacred city of Aksum. European explorers, B. 
began making many maps of Africa to advance science and knowledge, locate and extract resources, and spread Christianity. This map was made based on sketches and notes of the famous explorer, Dr. David Livingstone. There is a super important attribution to this map. It was made with information obtained from natives and Arabs. African knowledge made this map. Following this so-called exploration of Africa by Europeans, the colonial powers completed for, con competed for control over parts of the continent in 1895. Kenya was declared a British Africa, a British East Africa protectorate. At this point, Nairobi did not exist. And it's not found on this map. Dagoretti, which today is neighborhood of Nairobi in the West. Nairobi was established as the railway line was built to Uganda. The railway was designed to make it cheaper to transport cargo between the ports of the coast and the interior. Nairobi is positioned in a relatively flat area. At the start of the climb, the more mountains, terrains, and in a cooler climate, it was perfect as the starting ground for difficult railway construction and main node in the rail network. In, eight, in 1924, we got this early colonial map of Nairobi. You can already see the Parklands Club. That's nearby here. You can see how this was a colonial map. Some people may call it data colonization. I don't know what that means. There are two golf clubs. There, uh, the, race, the, the race course, the clubs, this is not a map that a Kenyan would be making of Nairobi. Actually, Kenyans were not allowed to live in Nairobi during that time. Here is a later map which now shows Kibera label. Kibera land was first given to the Nubian community in recognition of their assistance to the British during the First World War. They had come from what's now Sudan as fighters in the British Army. They received one of the famous 99 years lease. What you can see here really clearly is the railway line, which follows contours to the hills of Nairobi. And of course, the golf course. You can also see Nairobi Dam, the waterways that goes towards it through Kibera. This became important to Kibera, and also you'll see if you visit that, they are problematic, polluted. Sometimes the rains wash houses into them. This remained the level of map details for Kibera up until 2009. In the 1950s, the British Royal Airways, Air Force, photographed all of Kenya by air. It's an amazing archive, mostly sitting in boxes in a basement in Oxford, UK. Zooming in on Kibera, you can see that Makina village was well established at that time, along with nearby farm plots. Kibera is clearly unplanned compared to the nearby grid of estates. The golf course is established. The railway runs through. Near the bottom is the Nairobi Dam. They even had a yacht club there. Over the decades following independence, you can see that Kibera grew into a huge informal settlement. Hundreds of thousands of residents without reliable city services like water, water sewers, electricity uh, connections, water system, waste collections, but also one of 
the only afford affordable places to live for a city whose population was increasing extremely rapidly. Now we can see at Nairobi in OSM, just about four years after OSM started as a project, not much there because Kenyans were not using OSM then. Most people were not. Much of the early mapping of Nairobi was by a UK-based mapper who worked for Oxfam then, a one Mr. Fran Boone. He made that map. In 2009, the world was at a point of high-tech optimism. The internet and the democratization of information would make a huge change in the world. Companies would not control that change, but people would, because people would create the web themselves. That was the promise of an open web. Bringing tools of technology creation, not just as consumers, but as builders and innovators. To those who otherwise do not have access is still a goal I have for, Inst for instance, through our Kibera News Network media as well, and many of us have. But now we know that it isn't as simple as we thought. In 2009, Ushaidi was new. Hot was born around this same year, growing after Haiti earthquake 2010, bringing OSM to the whole globe was an obvious next step for mappers who, after all, used to be known as explorers. I think those who love maps often love to travel and discover new places. Who knew better than OSMAs the power of mapping your own city? Eric and Mikel wanted to share this idea, and, and partly thanks to the Ushaidi, as well as other organizations. They brought some German GPS over here to Nairobi and met some really great, amazing people in Kibera. Lucy, Steve, and Zach are here. Please wave to the people. This simplifies the story a bit. Of course, you have to imagine that Nairobi wasn't the Nairobi of today. It was full of people excited about technology, sure. But also things like Wi-Fi were not easy to find. Computers had viruses. Electricity was spotty. In 15 years, this place has become very, very far. The Kibera we are talking about is only two kilometers away from here, an area that was once a blank spot in the government map. Map Kibera arose from the desire to expand OSM beyond the confines of Europe and North America. It pushed the boundaries of what then new technologies could do. I moved into Kibera 16 years ago having been displaced by post-election violence 2008 from Naivasha. For the first time, I met Erika and Mikael. That was a year after. I had wanted to become a journalist, but did not get a chance to study it until I met them. The duo introduced us to what mapping using OpenStreetMap really meant and could do. With all of us excited, about 25 people, youth from Kibera, excited about new technology, you can imagine most of us had never even touched a computer before. Yet one thing to know about Kibera people is that we are so proud about ourselves that we are so proud to be Kiberians. That is our home. That is our community. That is where we come from. 
And what have we learned over the years? That communities can be empowered to map themselves, to tell their own stories in their own perspectives, and amplify their own voices using maps and stories. If given a chance, they can even come up with their own solutions to their own problems. We produced the first digital map of Kibera in 2010. We wanted to show the world that this is who we are, what we have, and the things we do not have as a people. Later that year, with funding from UNICEF, we broke the map down into four thematic areas, health, security, water and sanitation, and education. There wasn't an organization then. There was the idea that the mapping will be voluntary, just like in Europe. But the model had to be different. The mappers at least needed to eat, and we needed to learn computers, and we also needed devices. We decided to introduce Voice of Kibera and Kibera News Network. A lot of questions were asked of us. Why were we doing whatever we were doing? Why were we even mapping? How was the map important to us? It was hard to explain how difficult it really was to make a difference. But coupling up our mapping with citizen journalism became so powerful, a very strong combination, strong package, because then we were able to show the evidence in form of data and be able to advocate for the services we needed. Having done Kibera, we moved a way to replicate this in three other informal settlements, Madare, Mukuru, and most recently, Kangemi. Clearly, the type of information that could be mapped by a local resident of a complex place like Kibera is going to be far superior in many cases to that of any outside person. The school's map also attracted so much attention that through the support from Gates Foundation, we went deep to develop a website. Open Schools Kenya was meant to make education information easily available, accessible, and useful to everyone. Parents would make informed choices of which schools to send their kids to, depending on their capabilities and also preferences. Government would also use the map and the data to improve education uh, issues in the area, while schools would also get to know what other schools were doing differently. But this, getting this work, getting this to work was not easy. We collected data, and this was data about informal schools that no one had really ever collected before. We then shared the data publicly. And certainly, if we, are, we had collected it, if they are, had collected it, they had never shared it with those schools. So we found that one of our greatest impact was to print out the maps and give them to the schools. Being on the map could be powerful in its own right. That does not mean we stop there, but representation matters, and who represent us matters too. The school's map had other important results. One of our MPs used it to show the need for more secondary schools and get more resources to Kibera from the government, for example. But we also think that just getting onto the map by people from our own community, by us, with us, for us, the young people, was important to us. 
Later on, in partnership with World Bank, we moved out of Nairobi to help four counties map their publicly funded projects. This was a participatory budgeting program that would let members of the public, different wards, decide on what projects they wanted implemented in their various areas. It was, again, a decision-making tool. It had to be printed and shared and even painted on the walls as murals. During COVID, we worked with Ushaidi to map things related to the outbreak, like distribution of hand washing stands, to see where the greatest needs were. Work continues. Mapkibira has these past years been engaged in impact measurement in partnership with LEAF, that is Livelihood Impact Fund, conducting surveys across Kibera on lighting impact, waste management in Mukuru Slab, and internet, internet connections in Kibera. Hard projects, we call them. Projects that bring something tangible that we can look at and say, this came to be after mapping exercise by Map Kibera team. This is something that we always have wanted. Youth that join up for data and mapping want to be able to say to those residents that they, that map that they are making has something tangible for their lives. That they'll get something, something that is hard because it's not always very fast, but always we feel good about having something to deliver to our communities. African Sea is one project I can also not forget. This project aims to install solar panels to some selected schools in Kibera. The schools that we had mapped and conducted a feasibility study on. Around the world, Map Kibera has inspired a movement, been covered, contributed to the media, exhibited in museums, transformed education, and inspired results, and even practice of development. Our work is not done yet. The world is always changing. This drone imagery captures clearance of Langata Link Road that now bisects Kibera. Kibera people did not like this map. And so Zach made a very quick map to show schools that would be affected and demolished. This project has been going for 15 years. Many results have come from it in various parts of Kenya. And there have been quite few projects by people that have been inspired by Map Kibera and had similar approach, using OSM and empowering people to make and use data locally. But this process isn't necessarily fast. It has taken quite a lot of perseverance and sometimes single-minded dedications to an idea much like a lot of OSM development. What wasn't mentioned here were a lot of these challenges that came up. And overall, the hardest one being creating syst systematic change with a map. It is possible, just not easy. But much like technology as a whole, the technology utopianism of early 2000s has changed, and so has the map utopianism. We now know that democratization of web doesn't necessarily make it possible or at least easy for people to create the world they want, improve the balance of power, wealth, or even information. When it comes to mapping, we might say the same thing. It's a hard process to make change with maps. Even if thanks to the new technology, it's an easy process 
to make the maps. But we are still here doing something special, which has not changed in fundamental sense. We still believe that coming together to create shared data ourselves, that is, geodata, works. There are so many other web-based and digital projects that we have seen come and go because they were great ideas, and they may were even great for a number of years. But new technologies eventually overtook them and made them obsolete. Mapping on the ground by people and with people being one thing, that is not going to disappear. The reason is that you always need the people, even with the most advanced AI technology and drones and techniques of mapping. You still need to know what are you doing with your maps. A map is ultimately a tool. People need to use it. What's the story your map is telling? I want to make a pitch for supporting local mappers, especially those who like Map Kibira are mapping in our own communities. What we do is really hard to sustain. One outcome of internet and social media and digital is that we are closer than ever. But at, at, at the same time, and I hope you get this from being here in Kenya. Cultures does not really transfer over internet. The subtle ways people communicate, the taste of food, the smell, and the way people navigate their lives, their families, their day to day, you get pieces of it. But the kind of thing, the kind of things I was just sharing about, about what we do, requires intense local knowledge and involvement. Being part of making the map means that the mappers are part of the story. What happens next? That includes all of you who contribute to the Kenyan map from far away and from the ground. We can all work together. Creating maps together is what we are here what we hear in this room love, and we do it using the internet, sitting far apart from each other. But we also do it together at gatherings like this, and through mapping parties like the ones we had on Thursday, and through chapters. We have lots of folks here in Kenya getting together and building maps, and also helping to change and improve the lives of people and places. If there is one thing I hope you take away from your time here in Kenya, is that what you are doing is really about the people. That the, the other mappers around you matters. We are special and unique in our own ways, but together we have money to change the world. While we make, that while we may keep on inventing new things, there is never going to be a point in future where maps won't be, need, won't be needed. Is there time? I don't think so. Let's keep mapping. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Joshua. So. Uh, we, the stage is open for questions, so in case you have any questions, please raise your hand and uh, the mic will be passed to you. Oh. 
Thank you. Great talk. Um, so I'm wondering, uh, you have had all these projects doing really for your community, and this is really great. Did you ever then get in touch with the government, and did it help to escalate what you're doing, uh, let's say, to higher levels? Yes, that's a great question. Thank you. I would say yes and no. Sometimes we get engaged with the government, sometimes no. Many of you here knows how sometimes difficult it is to work with the government. It's a lot of process, a lot of bureaucracies. But like I mentioned in the presentation, in the talk, we had a one member of parliament that was so cooperative and was a lover of education. So for that case, he really helped us to reach out to the government and even to use our maps and data to bring change in Kibera by building new schools, new secondary schools, because the map showed that there are a lot of primary schools, a lot of informal schools, but there were very, very few secondary schools. So he used that to build schools and even to distribute them across Kibera. So that was one example. We have also worked with Minister of Education uh, in our education mapping. And the government, interestingly, comes down to Kibera to ask for our maps, health map, security map, especially during elections time. So yes, there is a way we work with them, and sometimes not. I have a comment, not a question. So thank you, Josh. Thanks for everything. Uh, one thing that really got my attention was uh, when you said, even if we have the most advanced technology, the most advanced AI, you know, a lot of us are, we, we work with technology, we work, you hear flashy words and people are like, oh yeah, AI, but you are 100% correct. Uh, AI is nothing without the people and building the community. So I want to thank you for also bringing that up to the stage. Yeah, thank you. We have to put the people in the middle. It's all always about the people, not just the technology. Thank you for that. OK, thank you for the nice presentation. And uh, myself, I have found this presentation helpful and especially the project. So my question is, what are the technological limitations that you have faced during the project and how did you manage to solve them so that this can be maybe, it can be a lesson for other people doing similar or even if they're not similar projects in the other areas? Thank you. That's a great question. Um, Technological challenges are uh, coming from Kibera, like I mentioned in the talk. Most of us, Kiberians, had never touched a computer before. And so it means that it's a long process to train us to be able to learn this new technology. And us, after learning it, be able to also train other people. Like now we've been moving around from slum to slum, training youths in different informal settlements to also learn these new skills of mapping and even storytelling. So that space where you have to train people from the scratch to be able to learn this thing was a challenge. Yesterday we had a talk from Zach and Laura about how they're training young schoolgirls on how to map using OSM. Again, we realize that it's a long process because this is really young minds. And so you, it's different from training or uh, uh, engaging university students because these are people who at least have some basic ideas. But these other ones are just fresh. So a lot of things you have to start from the scratch and you have to go slow so that they can understand and master what you're talking about.
Can you tell us a little more about how you decided to begin doing this citizen journalism and what, what was going on that made you think about why that was really important and how did that sort of come about? Another great question. Thank you for that. So uh, in Kibera, we felt so uh, misrepresented, so neglected, so marginalized. And so after doing the maps, first produced the first digital map of Kibera, went down to break it down into different thematic areas, health, security, water, sanitation, and education, asked for what people wanted at that time, because we asked them, what do you want? We have produced the map. We have broken. No, we need to break it down. How do you want it broken down? What would you prioritize to be the first four? So they came up with that list. And so after that, we realized, how can we make people talk about these maps? How can we make people talk about some of the issues that have been highlighted by the maps? For example, we have so many clinics in Kibir that are all private. What does that mean to us? It means that they are expensive to us. And we are citizens. We pay taxes. We need government services. So we started Voice of Kibera to start having people talk about these issues. Uh, Voice of Kibera is an SMS reporting platform. So people will send text messages of what's happening around them, what has happened, what's going on. And so we saw a lot of interactions. People have a lot to report, to talk about, and issues affecting them, and issues highlighted by the map. And then we have uh, in, uh, mainstream media and international media will not come down to Kibera to talk about these issues. They would only come when there is protests, demonstrations, uh, disease outbreak, for all the bad reasons. And so we say we need to be able to tell our own stories in our own perspective. We don't have to wait for CNN, BBC, or other medias to come here and tell it for us. Why don't we start our own channel? And we started Kibera News Network so that we can be able to tell our stories in our own perspective. Yes, that was the drive. Uh, we have a couple of questions from Venules. Uh, so the first one is, what does the future of Map Kibera look like? That's a, a tough one. Most times if you ask me that, I don't know. <laughs> but um, we want to grow further. We, want, we started in Kibera, and a lot of people have asked us, why are you still calling yourself Map Kibera? Why are you not calling yourself Map Kenya? Because you're working across Kenya. And it's hard to change that name. It's a process, not hard, but it's a process. Uh, we are looking forward to move. Uh, we have already moved out of Kibera to other informal settlements. We have already moved out of uh, Kibera and other informal settlements in Nairobi to outside Nairobi. And we are looking forward to move up to the rural areas and even out to Africa, given the opportunity and resources. Yes. OK. Uh, the next one is, did you make a fancy house addressing system so each home would have an address? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> but that's something we may consider doing moving forward. Uh, how did official maps represent Kibera when you moved there, and how different is that now? Like I mentioned, it, used, it was a blank spot in the government map. So that was also another drive. Like, how can our home, a place we live, be represented as a blank spot in the government map? So we said we have to map it. We have to map it ourselves. And with the help from OpenStreetMap team, we did the first digital map of Kibera. So because we didn't want our home to be seen as a blank spot, we said, look, this is where we live. We live. We, have, we need to show the world that this is our home. This is who we are. This is what we have. This is what we don't have. And so that drive made us come up with the first digital map of Kibera. And then it became so exciting. And we realized that, oh, it was not just doing a map of Kibera. Now, this thing is getting attention and it's getting more serious. UNICEF wants to fund us. We don't have an organization. We need to start one. 
We don't have a bank account. We need to get one. And then we became up Kibera without even knowing. And the last one in Venueless is, so this is a great inspiration to other communities. Great work done. Uh, how is MAP Kibera leadership structure like? Ah, that's a good one. So when Eric and Mikhail came down to Kibera and helped us start mapping and produce the first digital map, they brought us the Germans, the GPS gadgets. They trained us on mapping and citizen journalism and then they went back to America. So they are still the founders, but we have the directors here. They are the trustees and the founders, and then they, we have the directors in Kenya and coordinators and volunteers. That's how it looks like. All right, thank you. Uh, any other question from the room? Okay. You have mentioned that you are just integrating storytelling with your special technology. So I think storytelling is, is, is something essential, especially when it comes to capturing the rock knowledge, especially in mapping. So I'm um, just asking that maybe apart from Open Street Map team, and uh, as you mentioned, the UNICEF, what are other organizations, maybe the local and international ones, which are just who, who are just collaborating with you, or partners, or partner, or maybe you are just having the partnerships with different organizations? Because I think through partnerships and the collaborations, it's where also you can ensure the sustainability of this project. As I see, it directly address some of the sustainable development goals direct. Thank you. Yeah, so we, we, we have partnered. We have collaborated with many other organizations, both local and international. UNICEF was, being, uh, was the first one. And then later on, we also got a funding from uh, UN Habitat. We have also worked with World Bank uh, to do counties project. We have done Indigo Trust. We have worked with Gates Foundation. Uh, we've worked with Gold Kenya locally. We've worked with Red Cross. Yeah, and some that I may not remember now. But yeah, we've really partnered with other organizations. And we are also open. We are still open to more and looking forward to even more and more partnerships and collaborations. You, of course, cannot do it alone. And sustainability is a big challenge. So we have to battle it. Any other question from the room? Uh, mine mine is, a, is a very uh, simple question. How big is the number uh, of the whole team, including the volunteers? So thank you for that question. So when we started, we were many, actually. Like you saw in the slide, we were like 25 youths from Kibera. Over time, People dropped out because, again, people have different uh, reasons and different priorities. Some would want to go back to school. Some would, want, would get jobs elsewhere. Some would want to do other things. So we reduced to around 10 over time. But now we are even less because of sustainability issue. So currently we are eight. Uh, plus other volunteers. So what we do is to try and engage uh, volunteers and the new people we train uh, to help us. And so in partnership, we, we have collaborated so much with youth mappers from different universities. So whenever we get big projects that need manpower, we always have someone to reach out to. Say, we have a project in Madare, for example, Let's reach out to some youth mappers from University of Nairobi or JQA or K Kenyatta University. And so we, we get them because these are people that already have a basic knowledge or they have an idea of this mapping using OS OSM means. So it becomes easy. And also in Kibera and Madare and Kangemi, we have teams there. 
So that's how we have been operating. It's so difficult to just come from Kibera, for example, and step into a new informal settlement and start mapping there because you don't know. It's the locals who knows. So they know how to navigate. They know what is where, what is missing. And the locals also know them. So it's them who you use. That's the approach we use. We empower them by giving them skills and knowledge on how to map. And then we just help them with technical uh, assistance. Thank you so much for the talk. So OpenStreetMap was originally designed not exactly for places like Kibera, right? The tagging schemas, the types of data were specified with other kinds of cities and neighborhoods in mind. Were there any times that you had difficulty applying the tagging schema to describe conditions in Kibera? And can you give an example of that? Thank you. Yes, I think we had that. And the challenges with taggings, and Zach can talk more about this. Uh, there are some tags that were really difficult and we had to like rephrase and reframe. But I would leave this to Zach because he's our technical guy. <laughs> yeah, of course you had that problem. So over the years, uh, we've just been customizing the, the tags uh, to just fit with uh, the data that we're collecting in Kibera. So we have been documenting that process. So some of them are on the, on the wiki page. And we also have another document that we are willing to share. So yeah, it's been a challenge. So what we've been doing is just trying to customize to fit. Uh, so basically, it's just looking at the information that you want to, uh, to work with. Then we just now customize the other tags to fit with that. But uh, maybe the other thing that we need to do is maybe now take it to the the other team that now do, does the voting, because we've also had a problem. Some of the tags that you are putting there are questioned, but uh, we are more than open to share that document that has uh, the, uh, the different tags that you've used uh, for different projects. Yeah. So when you are doing the health, uh, health mapping in 2010, uh, there's not that tag for, what are they called? Uh, Natural harbor, uh, harbor list, we didn't have that uh, tag. So we had to develop like one specifically for that because it was not, not there on OSM. Then I think uh, tags to do with water points. So there are lo a lot of information that we were trying to collect. Uh, for example, like operational status back then in 2010, it wasn't there. So we uh, also create, uh, we were able to create that. So most of them it's the attributes, uh, the attribute tags that are not there. So apart from the, the primary tag, we were able to develop now other secondary uh, tags. So most is usually around water points, uh, also toilets when you're mapping the toilets, like the closing hours, opening hours, uh, who is the operator and all that. So we've been able to, uh, that's what we've been doing over the years, just to try to customize, to fit with the information that you're collecting. Yeah. But I'm glad to see that uh, most of them are being adopted. So we've seen a lot of changes in the tags. Uh, one just came in, uh, in Venilis. So has the government taken any action as a result of your mapping efforts and the stories from Kibera News Network? Yeah, that's a good question. Yes, the government has done a lot with our maps. Uh, for example, the security map that they come for many times during elections, they have used that to put up lights, security lights, in areas we map as insecure, areas that people would get mad at night and all that. Uh, they have either placed a security light or a police post in those particular areas. So that was a good impact. Health, yes, they have brought in a lot of mo mobile clinics in Kibera because the map could show that we don't have uh, we had uh, actually a lot of clinics, but they were private. So the government brought in a lot of mobile clinics to help people, clinics that would now be affordable. Uh, schools, yes, we have seen a lot of secondary schools being built in Kibera after we showed that uh, the data revealed that there are so many primary schools, but very few secondary. Um, water and sanitation map, yes, a lot of toilets have been built even by other NGOs 
and even the government uh, during their NYS project. So yeah, we've seen a lot of impact, uh, even from the government using our maps. All right. Uh Thank you for your talk. It was great talk. I would like to um, get to know what is the relation between uh, Map Kibera and uh, Ozan Kenya? Is it the same or overlap? Or <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for that. Yeah, um, we are part of OSM Kenya as Map Kibera, and we have good relationship. Um, a lot of OSM Kenya members. Uh, not a lot, but some have really interned with us. Uh, Laura, Sharon, Karanja, Peter Genga, Orina, some of them are in this house. Those we have really worked with closely, and we, they have interned with us. They have, some of them have even helped us do some projects. So there is uh, a good relationship between Map Kibira and OSM Kenya. Yes. We call them Map Kibira alumni. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you for the talk. And I uh, have uh, one question. Maybe you can elaborate uh, more. Like uh, mostly in the slums, you find out that uh, uh, a church on Sunday, uh, on a building on Sunday is a church. And uh, during the the week the weekdays it's a school how do you different uh, differentiate uh, that this is a school and uh, this is a church that's a very interesting question where do you come from <laughs> <laughs> i'm from Dedan kemad university ah, here. okay well, no where i mean where you live i'm a, i'm still from Nyeri. okay karatino all right so yeah, that's very common. That's very typical in a slum setup. And Lucy will tell you, Lucy walks around most of the time to do updates. Um, today is a church, tomorrow is a bar. Today is a video hall, tomorrow is a butchery. So that's why we are the locals. That's why it's important. And I mentioned in, our, in one of the slides that the locals understand their areas better. And they are the best people who can even help to update this data. So d updating the data is key. And how do I update data if I don't know my area? So a way in which we have designed it is that in Kibera we have people responsible for their various villages because this is a place they know, this is a place they live in, and the people there knows them. And they know us as Map Kibera. So in case of any small changes, they just inform us. All our team members will see and have that updated. So, but it's very common, that kind of story, like things change every day, and a shop today is something else. And so people, we have to have people updating that regularly so that our data is up to date. Uh, maybe a follow-up on what he's asking. Yeah. So there are some places, I, I believe also in informal settlements, this happens. On Sundays, I think it's what he meant. On Sundays, it's oh. a church. But on Monday, it starts, it goes back to being a school. So how do you map that? Oh, so that's a very unique case. I mean, it happens. Um, so we have to consider what is it mainly for. Like maybe a school, a church uses a school on Sunday. On That doesn't take away the fact that it's a school. The church has only hired it for that particular day but it still remains a school. So that's how we approach it. Uh, so I think the other way that we've done also in the, uh, on the attributes, we add the information, how, how is the school being used? So uh, some of the services that the school is providing. So if the school is uh, renting out the space for, for church services, then you also have that in the information. And then the other way will also be maybe separating them. So having a point for, for the church, and another point if they are it differently, so just uh, differentiate between the two. So one, one point becomes for the school and the other. But also, the other thing is also just to also, on the attributes for the school, is also just to 
are that uh, the school is being run by if the school is being run by the church also just put also that information that is being run because you have a lot of such schools that are being run by religious institution even inside mosque you find like there are schools that in so you just put the point for the mosque but also still a point for the school yeah all right thank you uh i believe we can close the last one he'll be the last one on missing tagging uh, it seems that something is uh, one more tagging is missing because uh, there is a lot of touristic shelters uh, mapped in Kibera with description rental houses so I was kind of wondering what is being mapped there is it uh, is it some uh, house that uh, apartments that can be rent, uh, rented or is something entirely else but because probably it is not a touristic shelter i'm not sure i got that question right do you want to repeat please <laughs> I, I think that's a problem oh, that we've been that got it that got i think it. the pro problem that we've been facing a lot of people also trying to add, add attributes on the data so we've we are trying so much to try to capture uh, what guys are adding. So we've had that problem over the years uh, on different data sets where someone <coughs> will just come in and just add another attribute or uh, something else on the map. So probably that someone who added, we maybe it skipped us, but we'll have a look at it. But that's something that we've been struggling with, especially if you look at the data in Kibera, it's so dense. So sometimes it's easy to miss out also some of those things that people are doing. Uh, unless we are doing updates that when you realize that uh, there are some tags that have been added. One common one I'll say is we had a problem where someone was adding a tag for the name and they were changing the name of the schools. So we kept having a problem with uh, people telling us uh, we are seeing two names of the same school. Uh, like It's a school but has two different names. So it's a problem that we're having. Maybe if we, uh, anyone who maybe can also help us to maybe be tracking because sometimes it's hard because of the how dense the data is so easy to miss out some of those things so probably that's someone who added something there that we we didn't notice yeah but it's, it's happening we, we've been that's what we've been dealing with uh, a lot of uh people interfering with the data and adding things that are not supposed to be there all right thank you joshua uh if you have any other questions for map kibera you can find joshua and ask him so we'll be breaking for tea uh, just a quick announcement. We'll be taking a group photo in the foyer uh, before lunch. So make sure you are available then. I'll see you after tea. Last reminder, please don't forget if you're interested to come to Kibera down to our office, sign up. Thank you.